Welcome to the Step 1 of You Study Guide, and in this lesson, we learn about cystinuria, organic acidemias, and glycogen regulation. Cystinuria happens when there is an excess amount of cystine in the urine. The excess cystine precipitates into stones that are hexagonal in shape in the kidneys. It is caused by hereditary autosomal recessive disorder that occurs in 1 in every 7,000 people, where the intestinal transport of cola Cysteine, ornithine, lysine, and arginine is defective. And more importantly, the renal proximal convoluted tubule can't reabsorb the cola either. A person suspected of having cystinuria should be given a urinary cyanide nitroprusside test. Cyanide will reach the cystine, turning it into cysteine. The nitroprusside binds and changes the color to purple. A positive test is diagnostic of cystinuria. From here, the treatment of cystinuria is to increase hydration and urinary alkalinization and chelation. The alkalinizing agents, potassium citrate, acetazolamide, and the chelating agent, penicillamine, combined with the increase in hydration will increase the solubility of cystine, allowing it to dissolve and thus removing the crystals. Organic acidemia is a condition in which the amino acids are not properly metabolized causing a buildup of acids, resulting in acidemia. As the organic acids build up, gluconeogenesis will be inhibited. This will cause the blood glucose levels during periods of fasting to be lower than normal. And to make up for it, ketones are produced, which ultimately cause ketoacidosis. This, in turn, results in a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. The urea cycle is inhibited, which also causes hyperaminemia. Vomit, valine, odd-chain fatty acids, methionine, isoleucine, and threonine can be metabolized to enter into the TCA cycle at succinyl-CoA. To get there, they are first turned into propionyl-CoA, and then, by propionyl-CoA carboxylase, they are turned into methylmalonyl-CoA. Methylmalonyl-CoA mutase, with the cofactor cobalamin B12, turns it into succinyl-CoA where it can enter. Propionic acidemia is caused by a deficiency of propionyl-CoA carboxylase. This increases the amount of propionyl-CoA and decreases the amount of methylmalonyl-CoA. The propionyl-CoA will instead get converted to propionic acid, decreasing the pH and causing metabolic acidosis. Propionic acid also inhibits the urea cycle, giving rise to the hyperammonemia. Methylmalonic acidemia is very similar. The same vomits, valine, odd-chain fatty acids, methionine, isoleucine, and threonine, are metabolized to propionyl-CoA. Propionyl-CoA is turned into methylmalonyl-CoA, however, methylmalonyl-CoA mutase is deficient and therefore cannot become succinyl-CoA. Methylmalonyl-CoA turns back into propionyl-CoA and eventually into propionic acid, causing the same acidosis and hyperammonemia. The treatment for these acidemias are limiting the amount of substances that are metabolized to propionyl-CoA in the diet. Now, let's go over glycogen regulation. In the muscles and liver, glycogen exists as a storage form of glucose. Glycogen phosphorylase turns glycogen into glucose. After a meal, glycogen synthase, as the name suggests, synthesizes glycogen from glucose. The glycogen phosphorylase is activated when it gets phosphorylated. This is done by glycogen phosphorylase kinase. When times are in need of glucose, the hormones epinephrine and glucagon seek to activate glycogen phosphorylase kinase and ultimately glycogen phosphorylase, which releases glucose. It is activated by the following mechanism. Glucagon outside the liver cells binds to the glucagon G-protein coupled receptor. This stimulates adenylate cyclase, which converts ATP to cyclic AMP. At the same time, epinephrine on the beta-androgenic G-protein-coupled receptor also stimulates adenylate cyclase's conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP. High cyclic AMP concentrations stimulate protein kinase A, which stimulates glycogen phosphorylase kinase. On top of all this, epinephrine binds to the alpha-androgenic receptors, which stimulates the endoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. Calcium itself stimulates glycogen phosphorylase kinase, but also calcium binds to calmodulin, which too stimulates glycogen phosphorylase kinase. On the other end of the spectrum, 
There is glycogen synthase. When glycogen needs to be synthesized rather than being broken down, protein phosphatase will stimulate glycogen synthase to achieve this. After a meal, insulin is released, which binds to tyrosine kinase receptor that dimerizes. This stimulates protein phosphatase, but also glycogen synthase itself, thus synthesizing glycogen. Since both of these pathways are directly opposite, they need to be regulated so that they don't run at the same time. The way it is done is that protein phosphatase during times of glycogen synthesis inhibits glycogen phosphorylase kinase. At the same time, protein kinase A's activation during the glycogen breakdown will inhibit glycogen synthase. That's all for this lesson of step one of you. We'll see you in the next video.